We are now live. So, hello everyone. My name is Avi Hoffman. I am the founder and CEO with my mother of the Yiddishkeit Initiative, whyilovejewish.org, and this inaugural international virtual Why I Love Yiddish Fest. I want to thank Joan Lyman for this amazing liberation ceremony, the commemoration ceremony that we just saw. And I want to thank all the dignitaries that participated, all the wonderful people who took their time to share with us. Um, we did have, because we're live, we are able to deal with certain things that uh, happened. And so um, one of the things that happened is that we had a few errors and I would like to um, fix them right now. So Francis Suarez is actually the mayor of the city of Miami. The caption on his video segment mistakenly identified him as Carlos Jimenez, the mayor of Miami-Dade County. So our sincere apologies for that and we will fix that. Um, also, apparently Abe Luria's age was incorrectly stated. He is actually 99 years young. Biz hundelt and zwanzig, he should only live to 120 years old. Um, also, just so you know, there may be some of you that have been watching on the website. Uh, we have been having some technical difficulties on the website. So if there's an issue, you can always go to our YouTube channel, or our Facebook Yiddishkeit Initiative page. And uh, there you will find our live festival. We have seven days from basically 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Incredible programming. We are international celebrities from all over the world. And one of those celebrities, as far as I'm concerned, is with us this afternoon. And so you just saw him uh, interviewing in the ceremony, uh, our survivor, Abe Luria. Robert Watson needs no introduction for many, many people, but I will introduce him for those of you who don't know who Robert Watson is. There he is now. Um, I would like to just introduce you if you don't mind. You are a professor, an author, a historian, a media commentator and community activist. You joined the faculty of Lynn University in 2007 after spending 15 years teaching at universities around the country. You have published over 40 books and approximately 200 scholarly articles, essays and chapters on topics in history and politics. Your recent books, America's First Choice, the Nazi Titanic, which you will be presenting to us, The Ghost Ship of Brooklyn, and George Washington's Final Battle have received critical acclaim. You are a frequent media commentator. You have been interviewed by local, national, international television, radio, print, and online outlets, including CNN, MSNBC, Time, USA Today, The New York Times, BBC, and more. You served for many years as the political analyst for WPTV Channel 5 NBC, a Sunday columnist for the Sun Sentinel newspaper, and a regular guest on television shows To The Point and Issues, as well as radio programs on RTE One Ireland, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, WIOD, and WFTL. I hope I've embarrassed you enough, Robert. Um, and I can't hear you, so make sure you are not muted. Um, and um, I, we could not be more honored to have you here uh, telling us about your book, The Nazi Titanic. And before I go, until I come back for our live interview after, I just wanna say how honored I am to be your friend, to have met you, to be an associate and a colleague and I will now give you the floor. I will disappear and give you the floor to take over and introduce us to the Nazi Titanic. Make sure your volume is up and you're not muted and I'll see you uh, after your lecture. Thank you so much. Avi, thank you. Thank you. I tell you that was the, uh, the most enthusiastic and theatrical introduction I've had in my three decade long career. And uh, back at you, Avi, I consider it a real honor and uh, privilege 
uh, to, cons to count you among my uh, valued friends and, and, and colleagues. I wanna say hello to everybody and, and encourage you to check out all the programs that Avi and his team have put together. Uh, I commend you for a remarkable uh, series of events. Uh, I have convened several national conferences in my career. And while I'm talking, I'm going to share a screen. I put a PowerPoint together for everybody. There we go. Um, so uh, I've put many uh, conferences together in my career and it involved ticket sales and setting up uh, catering and hotels and all that, but nothing like this. I, I, you're doing it virtually on several continents, <laughs> uh, theater, film, lectures, music. This is quite a, an extraordinary undertaking and I congratulate you. Okay, let's get into the topic. And at the close, I'm happy to take uh, questions and continue the conversation. So here's a really strange title for you, The Nazi Titanic. So I've been a professor, I teach history uh, for 30 years, and I always tell my students, quite simply, there's more we don't know about history than we do know about history by a lion's share. The late great librarian of Congress, Daniel Borston, uh, used to say that 99% uh, of all the books that have ever been written have disappeared. Uh, they've been burned, uh, they've been destroyed on purpose, which is another lecture. Uh, they decomposed because of, you know, parchment and, and, and paper once upon a time was not as refined and chemically treated and so on as processed as it is today. Um, not only have we lost 99% of all the books that have ever been written, but you could argue that 99% of all the things that make us distinctly human, that would be love letters and poems and musical scores and games children play and recipes and things of that effect. We've lost much of that history, which means we only know a small slice of the larger human narrative and human story. Uh, one of the exceptions one would think would be World War II and the Holocaust. World War II being the world's worst and bloodiest military conflict and the Holocaust being the world's worst instance of genocide. Um, however, with World War II, we had embedded uh, historians and reporters. We had video technology, which is something we didn't have throughout history. And with the Holocaust, uh, unlike anything in history, remarkably, whether it's uh, Yad Vashem or the U.S. Holocaust Museum or uh, the Shoah Foundation, Steven Spielberg's efforts, University of Southern California, there's been a remarkable effort to tape and preserve the words of survivors, thousands of these tapes. So we know more about the Holocaust than virtually any event in history, which is a wonderful thing uh, to, uh, to know about. Uh, however, think of it this way. While we might have thousands of oral histories that have been taped, there are at least six million stories that will never be taped and that we don't know. So even with the Holocaust, there's more we don't know than we do know. Uh, the other thing I always tell my students is not only does history still have her secrets, but she has some whoppers. And that's one of them here with the Nazi Titanic. So let's uh, move into it. So um, I, several years ago, uh, wanted to write a book about World War II. And I also wanted to write a book about the Holocaust. Uh, I admit to being a history nerd. Uh, in my career, I've written on the Civil War, the Revolution, George Washington, Harry Truman, one of my heroes, and uh, events that I thought were momentous and, and, and interesting individuals like Lincoln. Uh, so World War II and the Holocaust were on my to-do list. So I was looking around for topics. You know, there have been, there's been so much written on the war and on the Holocaust that one would think, what is there yet to, to write about? A lot is the answer. So I was thinking of maybe writing about the last week of World War II in Europe. Um, that is, the Nazis kept very meticulous records, as did the British. But during the final days of the war in Europe, the Nazis were too busy dying, uh, committing suicide, uh, surrendering, and running for their lives to keep uh, adequate records. And the Red Army's racing in from the east, the Americans, British, Canadians, and others are racing into the south and the west, and it's just chaos. So um, I wanted to try to write about that final week in the war uh, and what really happened in that week. Now, 
given the topic and the sensitivities of it, uh, I figured how could one possibly do it justice? How could you get your brain around this final week of the world's worst instance of genocide and the world's worst war? So what I figured I would do is each chapter would be a day in those final several days. And I wanted to tell one story of love and one story of loss. Uh, maybe against all odds, a couple lived through various concentration camps and was reunited. Maybe a baby was born in that critical period. Who was the last soldier to die, the last Holocaust prisoner to die in the war? Uh, one story of love, one story of loss, and that would give it the kind of poignancy and power um, uh, befitting of that momentous uh, week. So I wanted to start around April 30th with Hitler committing suicide, uh, biting down on a cyanide, uh, shooting himself in the head and having his body burned uh, in the garden, the hat trick, the trifecta. Um, and I wanted to then end about a week or so later with VE Day. So that was going to be the book. So I'm digging around for stories of love and loss, and I come across, by, quite by dumb luck, frankly, a letter from um, uh, a major, his name was Noel Till, T-I-L-L. -L. He was a British officer who records that of all the horrors of, of the war, nothing prepared him for what he saw in the final days of the war when thousands and thousands of Holocaust prisoners were all killed uh, in the Baltic coast off northern Germany's coast. And I read that and I thought, what on earth? Uh, I never heard of such a thing. So I reached out to uh, Holocaust scholars, World War II scholars, museums, libraries, and everybody said, no, we never heard of such a thing. So I thought, that's interesting. So I set the letter aside, couldn't get it out of my head, but continued to dig for stories of love and loss. I then find another letter, again, quite by dumb luck, which is often how the process of discovery and history works. We all like to claim that it was our brilliant detective work, work and uh, our intellects, but no, it's dumb luck. Um, I found a letter by a general named Mills Roberts. He was a general in the British Sixth Commando, which is a special forces unit. And he was there on the Baltic coast in North Central Germany in the final days, hours of the war. And he wrote that he saw everyone die. So now I had two letters. So I figured this has got to be true. Um, and there were some things online but nothing scholarly, nothing with footnotes and, and citations and the kind of thing that you can sink your teeth in. You know, um, uh, the, you know, the joke, I guess, among historians is, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and somebody wasn't there to footnote it, <laughs> it wouldn't make a sound, right? So I kept digging and I, I couldn't find anything further on this. Lo and behold, long story short, it turns out that this event really did happen, but that the British government, uh, was so shocked and appalled by the horrors that they classified all these documents, get this, for 100 years from 1945, not to be opened until the year 2045, making it the 100 year secret. Uh, long story short, uh, with the help of uh, uh, Deborah Oppenheimer, an Academy Award winning filmmaker and, and uh, board member of the U.S. Holocaust Museum and others, we were able to get access to these documents to write the book. So here's the story. Um, what you're looking at now on your screen, it looks like the Titanic, doesn't it? That's because it was supposed to be a replica of the Titanic. The ship is called the Cap, C-A-P, Arcona, A-R-C-O-N-A, -A, named for Cape Arcona, which is a cape on the North German coastline. Uh, she looks just like the Titanic, except she has three funnels, three smokestacks, whereas the Titanic had four. Um, so uh, she was launched in 1927, uh, built by uh, Blum and Voss, which is still in business, one of the world's great uh, shipping companies, a German ship uh, construction company. And she was operated by Hamburg South America, or Hamburg Sud, S-U-D, uh, which is still in business as well. Uh, she had the chandeliers, you know, the seven course dinners, uh, the grand staircase, the Persian carpet, the gold, the silver, uh, opulent, just like uh, the Titanic. Now, she was launched in 1927 for a few reasons. One of them was this, German pride. You know, uh, 
in the years after World War I, the German economy tanked and the German people were licking their wounds. Uh, since Germany was a belligerent nation during World War I, they were severely punished by the victors after the war. Deindustrialization, demilitarization. They were forced to pay war reparations and so on. So Germany was on its knees economically and in terms of its national spirit. Um, so the company decided to build a ship. One, it would get Germany back into the maritime business of uh, ocean liners and, and shipping, but two, as a source of great pride. So they actually used the Titanic uh, as, a, as a design. Now, they boasted that she had more uh, lifeboats on it and her halls were more reinforced. So they thought a nearly as large as, if not better version uh, than the actual Titanic. And when she was launched, uh, she immediately was uh, seen as one of the most remarkable uh, ships afloat. Uh, she earned all sorts of nicknames like the Floating Palace, uh, the Queen of the South Atlantic, uh, and so on and so forth. Here's the specs for the ship. She would, uh, she's not unlike some of your finest, in fact, bigger than your finest cruise ships today, and maybe not unlike the Queen Mary II or some of these great ocean liners, a remarkable ship, uh, fast, large, opulent. Uh, she makes over 90 crossings in the, in the Atlantic, typically sailing from Hamburg, Germany, picking up more passengers in Europe, and then going to South America. Her stops included Brazil, Uruguay, and Rio, uh, excuse me, and, and Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. In fact, there was a, uh, a tango, an Argentine tango, named after the Cap Arcona, and a, an Argentine tango band was one of the bands that performed on the ship. Here's some more images. Looks like the Titanic. There's a celebrity. There were A-list Hollywood actors that traveled on her, uh, European monarchs, uh, the rich and famous. Um, you can see the uh, tennis court. She even had a heated pool at the time. So the ship, the Grand Staircase, it looks like the Titanic. Um, Here's some more images of the interior for you to look at, as well as an ad, very modern, interesting looking ad, uh, advertising a trip to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so the ship was quite something. Uh, however, uh, all that would change in 1933 and then again in 1939. So um, in 1933, Hitler comes to power, and it turns out that He's obsessed with these large symbols of, of power and, 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 and the, of the fatherland and nationhood. So, of course, one of them would be the ship. Um, and Hitler and other senior Nazis love the ship. Uh, she's referred to as the Nazi Titanic, thus the name of the lecture here and the name of my book. Um, so I would change again in 1939. Of course, September 1st, 1939. Uh, Hitler orders the Blitzkrieg invasion of Poland, and World War II begins. So um, Hitler and the other Nazis don't want the ship to be destroyed. So many ocean liners and, and freighters and other ships, uh, they were painted in a, a sort of an ocean camouflage. They were mounted with guns and machine guns, uh, and, and they fought and still sailed. But not this ship. They did not want to lose the Cap Arcona, the Nazi Titanic. So they moved her to the Polish coast. Here you can see I put a red star there. Uh, they moved her to the Pomeranian, the Polish coast. Why? Because the Southern Baltic and that area of Northern Germany, Northern Poland, it's really one of the last areas in Europe to be destroyed during the war. Uh, it's largely untouched for most of the war. So they moved her near present day Gdynia and Gdansk in Poland although the Nazis, after they took over Poland, renamed it Gottenhofen. So there the ship sits. Um, she rusts. You can see all of her beautiful paint and all the, you know, luxurious chandeliers and silver and everything are taken out of the ship. So she sits there rusting during the war on the Polish coast. Now, she did play some role. She was used as a floating barracks and a training platform for naval cadets. Uh, so there she sits. All that changes in the year uh, 1942. Uh, in 1942, Hitler uh, meets with Joseph Goebbels, his propagandist, 
And in a rare moment of sanity, um, Hitler says to Goebbels that, you know, we could lose this war. Uh, the war was taking a turn for the worst on all fronts, on their southern front in North Africa, even the impressive general, the Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, uh, the Desert Fox was kicked out of North Africa. Um, on the Eastern Front, with the invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, that goes belly up. The Nazis are victims, you might say, of their own success in that they raced so quickly and so deeply into, into the Soviet Union that when the winter sets in, the weather is so bad, Soviet Union was so backward that they lacked roads and bridges that resupplies, warm clothing, more fuel, ammunition, were not able to get to the German soldiers, many of whom froze, and then they were annihilated in a counterattack by the Soviets. On the Western Front, it wasn't going well. Uh, Operation Sea Lion. Uh, Hitler wanted to invade the British Isles. Uh, but before he invaded them, he wanted to bomb them back to the Stone Ages. So the Nazi Air Force, the Luftwaffe, uh, flies over England and is going to bomb the British Isles. But a few British pilots, uh, outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, manage to defeat the Luftwaffe. One of the greatest upsets and most important battles in world history. Winston Churchill celebrates what he calls the Battle of Britain by giving one of his great orations in honor of the few, those few pilots. So on all three fronts, all over, it's going badly. So Hitler says to Goebbels, we could lose this war. So he assigns Goebbels a new mission. You are going to open up a propaganda front in the war. You're going to open up a propaganda front. So what I need you to do, Hitler says to Goebbels, is to come up with some kind of propaganda scheme so grand that it makes the world hate the Allies and love us, the Nazis. So that's the argument. Now, this shows you how, how uh, out of it uh, Hitler is, that he thinks that some propaganda mo move could flip the world opinion like that and win the war. Now, what is this giant evil propaganda thing? They don't know. They don't know. Uh, but he assigns Goebbels the task of coming up with it. Now, what Hitler and Goebbels did know were Hollywood movies. It turns out that the two of them were avid fans of Hollywood movies. And here you can see Hitler and his top generals watching a movie. Uh, they considered themselves connoisseurs of fine film. It was not uncommon for Hitler and Goebbels to watch three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back Hollywood blockbusters with translators and interpreters in your ear uh, on, let's say, a weekend. Uh, then they would sit for an hour or more and debate the cinematography, the, the script, uh, the acting. So they considered themselves, I guess, to be Germany's Siskel and Ebert, <laughs> one might say. Uh, and among the movies they watched all the time, and I put the three of them up here, it seems to be the three they watched the most. And this is from the file of You Can't Make This Crap Up. Um, King Kong, Gone with the Wind, and Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, I guess because Snow White was German and lived in the Black uh, Forest, I suppose. Um, at any rate, so um, these are the movies they watched over and over and over. Um, the movie that they could not stand was Casablanca. Uh, you know, uh, because not only a great film, good action, drama, romance, but it's kind of an anti-Nazi propaganda film when you think about it. Uh, although unlike all the ham-fisted and sophomoric films that Joseph Goebbels produced, which you could tell within 20 seconds uh, that it was a, a propaganda film, Casablanca is, as I said, an action drama romance. So um, uh, this is what they did know was great films. So Joseph Goebbels writes that one day, the, three, the two of them are watching movie after movie after movie, but they watched a movie that left them so emotionally drained that rather than sit and debate it for an hour, they just sat uh, exhausted. Hasn't that happened to you? Sure. If, you know, Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan. Uh, I've seen Frozen. <laughs> I've seen movies that uh, it just leaves me emotionally drained afterwards, you can't get out of your seat in the theater. Unfortunately, Joseph Goebbels did not indicate which movie that was. 
Uh, so I, I would love to be able to tell you. It keeps me up at night trying to figure out what movie it was. But they, so the two of them sit there and they're watching the credits run. Now, as they watch the credits run, something horrible happens, according to Goebbels. He says that the two of them had the realization that all the producers, directors, cinematographers, script writers, screenwriters, actors were Jewish. And Goebbels said that uh, they kicked over all the chairs in the viewing studio. But that's when they had the idea. That's it. The propaganda thing that Goebbels is going to do this diabolical, monstrous move that's going to help them win the war. Goebbels is tasked to make the world's greatest propaganda film. OK, so that's what they're going uh, to uh, do. Um, so they proceed to uh, there's Joseph Goebbels, one of the sickest people ever to live. Uh, several years ago, uh, when doing research for my book, I reread Joseph Goebbels' diary in its entirety in English translation. It was stomach turning. The guy had no ounce of humanity, no empathy. Uh, he was a monstrous person. Everything to him was a, a, a gigantic lie and uh, how he could just spin uh, these lies. It, it, it was difficult to read. Um, so what Hitler tasked Goebbels with doing is he doesn't want him to make his typical, as I said, ham-fisted uh, propaganda films. He wants rather something like Casablanca. He wants an action, drama, romance hybrid. Now, here's two of Goebbels' most famous uh, but pathetically done uh, propaganda films, Jude Seuss, uh, Seuss the Jew, uh, and Der Vigor Jude, the Eternal Jew. In almost all these movies, as you can see, the Jewish uh, uh, antagonist is depicted as kind of a devil figure or a Dracula figure, subhuman, and they all have basically the same plot. There's an idyllic uh, German hamlet until a Jew moves in, and then horrible things happen. And oftentimes the, the, the lighting gets darker when he's around. In some films, rats would scurry behind the character, less you miss the obvious. And um, there would be the foreboding, ominous crescendo of, of strings and music uh, building uh, and so on. So it was just ham-fisted. And in the end, the people would rise up and kill or drive away this person and everybody lives happily ever after. So Goebbels uh, and Hitler says, no, they want something like Casablanca, uh, you know, the action drama, or Gone with the Wind, an action drama romance kind of a thing. So there was a, a Nazi script writer by the name of Bratt, B-R-A-T-T, -T, who was working on a film for the Titanic. Long before James Cameron, he uh, figures out that people have a fascination with the Titanic. You know, here we are a century plus later, and people still seem to have a morbid fascination with the ship. I suspect if we could come back to Earth in another 500 years or 1,000 years, if climate change doesn't take us all out, um, there will still be movies made on the Titanic and still a museum exhibit traveling on the Titanic. So Goebbels says, that's it. Uh, we will make the Titanic, although they want to make the Nazi version of the Titanic. Now, what Goebbels and Hitler realize is they have a star for the film. Don't they have a replica of the Titanic? Sure, the Nazi Titanic the Cap Arcona. Um, so they're going to make the Nazi Titanic using the full size replica of the Titanic. They have her repainted. Uh, they put all the fancy uh, carpet and chandeliers and gold and silver back in the ship. They reassign entire units of the Wehrmacht, the army and the Kriegsmarine, the Navy, to be extras. They want one of these Cecil B. DeMille-esque cast of thousands greatest story ever told kind of a movie. So even though they're in the midst of a war, they reassign military units and Hitler and Goebbels provide an unlimited budget uh, to make this movie. They hire carpenters and set designers and, and all these folks in the middle of a war. Um, they hire the most handsome matinee actors and the most beautiful models. Uh, now, the one thing, however, that they're missing is a director. Um, it turns out, Goebbels writes, that they realized that all of Nazi Germany's great directors uh, either fled the country or were in concentration camps. Uh, so they finally find a guy, his name is Herbert Selpin, S-E-L-P-I-N. He's known as the Hedgehog. 
Uh, he's a very talented and very difficult filmmaker. And in some ways, Selpine is an odd choice to make the Nazi Titanic movie, the world's greatest propaganda film that's going to help the Nazis win the war, because he's not a loyal Nazi. But uh, they were desperate. He was one of the few top directors still alive and still free. On the other hand, he makes a lot of sense because um, he specialized in making action, drama, romance uh, hybrids. I went and watched, uh, I think, two of his movies uh, when I was doing research for this book. And his movies were um, kind of like Indiana Jones, you might say. They're all about a dashing professor and um, really, aren't they all? <laughs> uh, the dashing professor goes to Africa, uh, fights the locals, finds the treasure, gets the girl, basically Indiana Jones. So uh, they hire him and give him an unlimited budget and he proceeds to make the world's most expensive and greatest propaganda film. Fortunately for history, everything that could go wrong went wrong. They run behind schedule, they run over budget, the weather doesn't cooperate, the sailors get drunk on the set and destroy the set repeatedly. One of the lead actresses gets pregnant from apparently one of the soldiers. Um, you know, to film the sinking of a ship, uh, for realism, it's sunk at night. They actually uh, want to film in the ocean, but um, uh, you need lights uh, to film at night. Uh, Germany is under a mandatory blackout during the war so that the Allies don't bomb them. You know, they get these big Hollywood ballyhoo type of lights. They light up the set. Guess what happens? It gets bombed. Uh, so everything is going wrong. Here's some scenes from the, sh the, the, the movie. In the middle, that's Herbert Selpine with the ascot and the little round sunglasses. And it's a, a handsome actor, rugged actor there uh, playing one of the lead roles. Um, at the top, that's the captain of the ship and one of the uh, wealthy passengers. And at the bottom, you can see them on set. That's Selpine in the middle, uh, knee deep in water during the flood scene. He's talking to uh, the radio operator and one of the officers on the ship. So everything's going wrong. Selpine is getting pressured from Goebbels who's getting pressured from Hitler. Where's my movie? Uh, we need to win the war. Um, Selpine is, is livid with everything. He shows up on set one day and he's drunk and everything went wrong and he blows up. He curses Hitler, he curses Goebbels, he curses the Nazi party, and he curses the soldiers and sailors. Well, as you know, the Gestapo is everywhere. And uh, Herbert Selpine gets summoned to Berlin to explain his anti-Nazi rant. And when he's sent to meet Goebbels, they end up killing him. Uh, he's hanged. Uh, Goebbels says it was a suicide, but every indication was that uh, the Nazis set this up, took pictures and had him hanged. Um, so not surprisingly, Goebbels had trouble finding another director. Uh, they finally find a B-movie director named Werner Klingner with a K, uh, and he comes in and finishes uh, the film. So Goebbels sits down to watch his masterpiece that would make him the greatest director, uh, the greatest producer, I should say, the greatest producer that produced the greatest propaganda film. His idea was once this film is launched, they would build what they were referring to as Hollywood on the Rhine uh, in Babelsberg, and they would challenge Jewish Hollywood to show Hollywood that the Nazis can make the best film. So he sits down to watch this masterpiece and he's shocked at what he sees. Two reasons. One, it's unmistakable to anyone that watches the film that it's a metaphor for what's happening to Germany. It's about a fanatical captain, i.e. Hitler, who runs his ship into an iceberg, i.e. Germany into the war, and dooms all the passengers, the German people. Also, from the grave, Herbert Selpine has the last laugh. He fills the film with propaganda, but also anti-Nazi propaganda. So after all that, Joseph Goebbels orders that the film be destroyed and banned. Fortunately, some pirated copies of the film made it out to Paris and Prague. And today you can watch it uh, on YouTube with English subtitles, it's, it's still available. Uh, and one of the things, it's very difficult to watch, 
I was struck by one, how despicable and difficult it is to watch, but secondly, how genius the uh, cinematography is. Now, one of the reasons it's so good um, is because Hitler, Goebbels, and Selpine did not care if the actual ship sunk and, and actors died because they would be more realistic. Um, but here's another thing that's interesting. If, if you, I don't know if you agree with me, I, I think Cameron's Titanic was a great film, of course, but I don't think it's the best film on um, uh, the Titanic. I think that was the, the British film from 1958, A Night to Remember. Uh, Y'all remember that film or am I dating myself? <laughs> Um, so, uh, here you can see some films from some clips from that movie. Here's what's so fascinating. The director of the British film for all the ship and sinking scenes, he took the actual footage from the Nazi Titanic movie and used it. So here you can actually see there's the Cap Arcona. There's the Nazi Titanic and the footage that Herbert Selpine shot. Um, so it's very haunting to uh, see this. Okay. So. After the movie is banned, uh, the ship is sent back to the Polish coast where she rusts again for the next two years until spring of 1945. The uh, late winter, early spring of 1945 is one of the most harrowing periods in world history. Why? Because Hitler issues his infamous liquidation decree. Any concentration camp that is not yet liberated or destroyed uh, he does, he wants everything destroyed. Everybody killed, the camp raised to the ground, papers burned, uh, and wholesale slaughter occurs. Uh, we uh, historians don't have an accurate number of the number of people put to death uh, in these gruesome uh, final weeks. However, something interesting happens right after Hitler's liquidation decree. Uh, Heinrich Himmler, uh, the head of the uh, SS uh, enters and oversees uh, the camps. Heinrich Himmler enters our story. He sends notices to these concentration camps saying, if your camp is not yet liberated or liquidated, here's what I need you to do. Do not let your prisoners, their con your Holocaust survivors, fall into the hands of the allies. Now, what does he mean? Move them, kill them, fight back? Uh, he's unclear. Heinrich Himmler is unclear for a reason. Here's what he wants. He then sends his minions to meet with the concentration camp commandants. He wants everybody moved. They're all supposed to go to this place that you're looking at on the screen. That's KZ Neuengamme, N-E-U-E-N-G-A-M-M-E. -E -E. It's a large brick-making uh, concentration camp with some medical experiments in Hamburg, so north central Germany near the Baltic coast. So Himmler wants thousands and thousands of concentration camp survivors to go there. Why? He doesn't say. So they do go there. And on the death march from camps all over Nazi territory, thousands and thousands die on this forced rapid death march. Once they get to KZ Neuengamme, they are then sent to the Baltic. Uh, which is about 60 kilometers away. And some are sent by barge, some in trains and cattle cars, others by foot. Uh, and the Allies are bombing the region, so some are killed by friendly fire. Others die because of the gruesome pace of, the, um, of this march. Um, now, uh, when all these thousands of people get to the Baltic coast from Neuengamme, they're sent to the town of Neustadt, N-E-U-S-T-A-D-T, -E New City, which is in Lubick Bay, right on the Baltic coast. Um, now, why are they sent there? Heinrich Himmler has a diabolical plan. Here's what it is. He wants to load everyone up onto a large ship, the biggest ship he could find. So guess which ship Heinrich Himmler picks for this mission? The Nazi Titanic, the Cap Arcona, it's the biggest ship. Now he wants them loaded up on the ship. So he orders the Nazi Titanic to sail to Lubick Bay and the port of Neustadt. She does, uh, but she's so large that she's too big to dock at the, at, at, the, at the port. She has to drop anchor three kilometers out into Lubick Bay. Uh, here's his plan. He's gonna load the ship up with concentration camp prisoners and then he's gonna board the ship 
they're going to sail to meet with presumably Churchill, Truman, Eisenhower, Montgomery, someone. And Heinrich Himmler wants to negotiate two things. One, a separate conditional surrender on the Western Front so that the Nazis can put all their resources into stopping the army they were really afraid of, the Red Army, who were as bloody and brutal and subhuman uh, the, the, the Soviets in their treatment of the Nazis as the Nazis were to everyone else. The second thing Himmler wants is he wants uh, to negotiate his own rear end. Uh, I will give you, he, he wants to say, thousands of concentration camp prisoners in, re in return for you saving my life. So that's his crazy plan. Uh, there's no way the Allies would have accepted a conditional surrender. Truman's surrender is unconditional. There is no negotiating with the Nazis. They unconditionally surrender, period, exclamation point. Uh, right before Heinrich Himmler can go and board the ship, however, he's caught. Now, in the final days of World War II, before the surrender uh, week into May, um, it's, it's chaotic. Hitler commits suicide in his bunker, as I mentioned earlier. Eva Braun, uh, his, his new wife, uh, commits suicide. Hitler even kills his favorite dog, his German shepherd, Blondie. Uh, Joseph Goebbels brings his wife and six kids to the bunker. They all kill themselves. Uh, Hermann Goering, the Luftwaffe commander, is on the run. He would later get caught and commit suicide. Heinrich Himmler's on the run, commits suicide. So there's thousands of people, survivors, in this Nazi Titanic and thousands at the port, no food, no water, and no one knows what the heck is going on. There's two Nazis in charge and you're looking at them here. At the top of your screen, uh, walking with the Fuhrer, that's Karl Kaufmann with the K and the K. He's the uh, head politician, you know, like a mayor or governor of that region. The bottom, you're looking at Count George von Basewitz Bear, B-E-H-R. He's the top Gestapo official there. Now, these two don't want to be responsible for thousands of Holocaust prisoners, and they don't know what to do, and there's no orders, and they know everybody's dead. So what they do is they come up with their own plan. Here's what we're going to do, these two say. We're going to load the Nazi Titanic up with as many concentration camp prisoners as possible. Then when the Allies race into the Baltic coast and forced us, force us to surrender, we're going to blow the ship up and sink her in the Baltic. That way, one, we will deny the Allies from getting a hold of the Fuhrer's beloved ship, the pride of the Third Reich, the Nazi Titanic. Two, the world will long for, will quickly forget about the actual Titanic because many more people will die. Two, three, four, five times more will die, they say, in the Nazi Titanic. And lastly, it's a final F you to the world from these sick uh, Nazis. As the Allies come racing in on May 3rd, in the final days of the war, as the Allies race in the British, uh, it was led by uh, General Mills Roberts. You remember that second letter I mentioned a half hour ago at the start of this? Um, General Mills Roberts uh, races in the special forces, the British, uh, backed by some Scottish units and others. They make quick work of the Nazis at the coast. It's not the Wehrmacht, uh, the regular army. It's the Volkstrom that's at the coast. Nazi Germany was running out of soldiers. Therefore, they just had a couple of young boys and old men with antiquated guns, and uh, many of them surrender. The rest are killed quickly. Some of the Hitler youth and young naval cadets run away, and the British take control of Neustadt, Lubeck Bay, and the Baltic coast. Now, when they do this, thousands at the port, and people are telling them, you've got to go out to that ship. It's filled with prisoners, and they're dying, and concentration camp survivors, and they're dying by the hour. There was this macabre scene for the final days of April and first days of May, where every hour or two, a shuttle, a, a little boat, a launch would go out to the Nazi Titanic with 50, 100, 300 Holocaust prisoners and put them on board the ship. Then they would throw a dozen or 50 off that were dead, or then they would load a couple into the, a couple dozen into the launch and bring them back to the coast, bury them in massive unmarked graves. Then an hour later, they take another couple dozen or a couple hundred back to the ship, and over and over and over, this is happening. So we don't know how many people, how many thousands of people are on board the ship. Uh, so when the British get ready to go out to the ship to save 
the thousands that are on board the ship, they hear a deafening roar. They look upward and the sky blackens from six squadrons of Typhoon bombers, Royal Air Force, British bombers fly into the, the bay and they aim at, they unload on the Nazi Titanic. Uh, these bombers are carrying uh, uh, 500 pound bombs underneath their wings. They have twin 20 millimeter cannons on each uh, wing. They can fire 60 pound rockets, which are about the size of an adult man. Um, and they unload on the ship. Uh, here's a Typhoon uh, bomber. Uh, as you can see, it's not a large bomber like an American B-17 or B-24 or British Lancaster. It's not a small fighter like the American Mustang or the British Spitfire. It's in between size, uh, sort of a hybrid. So too big for aerial fighting, too small for massive bombing. They specialize in hitting trains, tanks, and ships. So six squadrons of these fly in. Here you can see one in a museum today. Below it, you can see the 60 pound rocket there, which is about six foot and in length. You can see on the wings, the 20 millimeters, these big machine guns, these cannons on the wings, each of which fires a bullet about the size of a, a tube of toothpaste um, or a pen, large pen. And you can see the clips underneath for carrying a 500 pound bomb. And they blow the Nazi Titanic out of the water. Thousands of Holocaust prisoners on board the ship die instantly. The Baltic Sea is 42 degrees Fahrenheit in May. So as gaping holes are torn into the ship, frigid water comes pouring in below decks, filling up these holds that were just overcrowded with prisoners and survivors. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands, are blown off the top deck into the water. Of course, it's so cold, the water, and people had survived the Holocaust, a death march, and days without food or water. So they were so weak that many of them drowned immediately or died of, of hypothermia in the frigid water. Or as the ship is starting to roll over and sink, the suction pulled people underneath. Uh, those that were able to somehow survive this ordeal and, and, and cling on to a piece of, of wood that's floating or something, uh, they encountered another fate. These uh, typhoon, uh, 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 bombers uh, swing back around and with their machine guns, they strafe t -t 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 people in the water. Uh, then the, 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 the planes go racing down the uh, port, firing on the thousands of people at the port uh, in striped pajamas, you know, waving no to them. Um, uh, one pilot, his name was Alan Weise, W-Y-S-E, he wrote the following. He said that at the port, he was sawing, S-A-W, literally with his, you know, firing multiple rounds per second, firing, he was sawing torsos in half of all the people at the port and just leaving a trail of death and mayhem at the port. Then as he was strafing the people in the water, he said, I killed all the chaps in the water. He said, but that's war. Um, uh, <clears throat> one of the other pilots, uh, Pierre Klosterman, a Frenchman uh, who was with the freed French forces, but assigned to the Royal Air Force. I think he's one of the few pilots that knew exactly what he was doing, that he was killing innocents and concentration camp prisoners. Klosterman wrote that he didn't give a damn. Uh, he said, why? <clears throat> All, everybody I knew and loved had been killed by the Nazis. My city of Paris was, was destroyed. The war had gone on for so long. He said, I've, I didn't care. I was going to kill everyone and everything in the Baltic. And he fired every round, dropped every bit of ordnance he had on the ship and the port. <clears throat> then after the British pilots did their damage, they flew back to liberated ports uh, uh, in the Western parts of Europe. Um, so the ship was, uh, here she is. Uh, they filmed it. Uh, there's the Nazi Titanic on fire. Uh, amazingly, uh, some people made it off this. Uh, we, it's hard to estimate how many died and how many lived. Um, I estimate that at least 4,500 people died on board the ship. My guess would be perhaps 7,500 died on the ship. Uh, how many more died at the port? We can only guess. There were three other ships 
uh, near the Nazi Titanic. Uh, the Deutschland, another ocean liner, was at anchor. Then two ships, the Thielbeck and the Aten, uh, A-T-H-E and Aten, but the Germans would say Aten, were at the uh, two uh, freighters were at the, at the port. Uh, two of those three other ships sink uh, and are blown up, each with maybe 2,000 people on board. So more in the death toll. How many died in the death march? Thousands, uh, to be sure, to get there. One of the trains brought to the coast when the Nazis arrived and, and concentration camp prisoners were in the cattle cars, the Nazis ran for their lives and never unlocked the, uh, uh, the cattle cars. Days after this event, when the, the, it was discovered, everybody inside the train had died. So it's hard to guess how many, 20, 30,000 total involved in this incident. So among the two who survived, um, one was Francis Akos, A-K-O-S. Um, he was a, a violinist in the Budapest Jewish Symphony. He survives multiple concentration camps, the death march, and he's on the ship. He and others are blown off the ship. Uh, they're in the water. Uh, the Nazis are looking to rescue in the water some of their own uh, sailors. And they pull these guys out of the water. They see that they're uh, concentration camp prisoners and they throw them back in the water. Somehow these folks manage to swim, get this, three kilometers to the shoreline. Now remember, they just survived the ho Holocaust. Michael Phelps could not swim three kilometers of the shoreline in 42 degree water. As they're getting to the shore, uh, there are uh, several people lying on the beach, too exhausted to stand up and make it to town. When the Hitler Youth and Naval Cadets that ran away earlier from the fighting, they emerge from the woods and they're out of bullets, but with the butts of their gun, they bash the skulls in of the survivors on the beach. So A. Koch and others, uh, Bogdan Sokoviak and a couple other folks are treading water until the Hitler Youth and the um, uh, uh, naval cadets leave. Then they arrive and they're walking to town, naked, freezing, one can only imagine. Behind them, they hear the words, hands up, criminals. And there's a young German kid with a gun. He's ready to kill them. They think they're done. But then they hear machine guns uh, blast and the kid crumbles to the ground. It's General Mills Roberts and the British Sixth Commando. They save these folks. Uh, Francis Akos would live through this and move to Chicago, where this great violinist would become the principal first chair violinist of the Chicago Philharmonic, and then rise up to be the concert master. Just died a few years ago, had the opportunity to speak on the phone to him and his daughter, uh, Katie, uh, just a remarkable person. There were two brothers, Beric and Jozek Jakubowicz, Poles as the names would suggest, who um, were deep in the holds of the ship. When they're filling up with water, these two are floating up to the surface up to the top of the hold. The problem is the uh, hatch is locked above them. So they take a deep breath knowing they're gonna die. And at the last moment, the hatch is opened up. Some brave Holocaust survivors from the top decks, as the ship's rolling over and being attacked, they go below decks and save their comrades. These guys go running through the ship. Uh, parts of it are on fire, parts of it are underwater. Uh, they get to one place where the flames are racing down the hallway. The Jakubovic brothers look up because they're trapped. They, they climb on one another's shoulders and open up an air duct and climb out. As they reach down to rescue their rescuers, all those men were incinerated by flames. They get uh, onto the top deck. Uh, then what's happening is the ship, it's ro as it's rolling over, they have to shimmy across toward the bottom of the ship to stay above the waterline. Now, uh, Beric, the older brother, says, we got to get off the ship and swim. Jozek, the younger brother, can't swim. So they give the brotherly goodbyes. Beric goes down the anchor line into the water. Jozek stays on board. Um, now, the problem is, with all that fuel on fire, uh, the, the metal is basically cooking people alive. Um, Beric goes in the water. He's picked up by a German fisherman who takes him to the town. He will never tell Beric, his name, because he's so afraid of the Nazis. I tried to find out his name because I think he should be listed as among the righteous Gentiles in Yad Vashem. Uh, 
Barak is taken with a few other Holocaust survivors to a bakery. There's no food, but they can turn the oven on to stay warm and wrap up in burlap sacks because they were naked. In the morning, the doors kick down. Barak thinks he's going to die from the Nazis, but it's the British. They rescue him and take him to a hospital and clothe him. Guess who he meets in the hospital? His brother, Jozak. The British went out at night and Jozak, in order to live, he piled up the dead and sat on top of them so he wouldn't burn uh, on the, on the, on the, the ship. Uh, the two Jakubovitz brothers move to uh, just north of Boston. They marry, have kids, careers, and live long, successful lives. There's Beric Jakubovitz on the right, and there's Francis Akos, the great violinist who just passed not long ago uh, on the left. In closing, how could this have happened? Um, you and I know the difference between an ocean liner and a warship. You and I know the difference between a sailor and a Holocaust survivor. Uh, however, it was almost a perfect storm in the wrong way. Uh, it was very cloudy that day. This is the ship sinking, by the way. It was very cloudy that day. So uh, the pilots couldn't see. They had to drop down to below 2,000 feet for their bombing run. Uh, if you're a pilot, you don't want to be at that low altitude because you're susceptible to anti-aircraft fire. It was raining, cloudy. They went low, they went in fast, they launched everything and flew away. Secondly, uh, the pilots were young, um, many of them 19. Uh, the old man of the group was Johnny Baldwin, who was the commander of the of six squadrons. He was a ripe old age of 23. Um, uh, so many of them were young, only a few days of training. They were stuffed in the cockpit because the allies were running out of pilots. And thirdly, there was a rumor that the British were going to try to flee to Norway. They were going to load up what's left of their military on big ships and go to Norway and use the geographic isolation, the cold weather, the mountains, the deep fjords for one last stand, a final redoubt. So when these pilots flew into the Baltic, they see before them the biggest ship they've ever seen, the Nazi Titanic, who's low in the water, which means she's filled with people and fuel. So they, they probably assumed she was going to try to escape and they hit her and sunk her. Um, I think uh, just in closing that we need, and there's a shameless plug for the book. <laughs> uh, we need a, um, uh, in order for the words never again and never forget to truly have meaning, we need to dig up and find as many stories from the Holocaust as possible. Continue to tape oral histories. And then once we lose this magnificent generation, make sure the next generation steps up and tells stories. We need to tell them over and over and over again, especially today, where we've seen over the last few years an alarming resurgence in anti-Semitic violence here in the US and in parts of the world. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and Avi uh, will bring this star of the program back uh, for some Q&A. Well, you are the star of the program, and thank you, because I am blown away by the story, by your presentation. I had never really heard about this Nazi Titanic, so bravo to you for uncovering it, and, you know, it should be made into a major motion picture, as far as I'm concerned. Thank um, you. you know, a couple of things. Uh, well, thank you. Um, you know, a couple of things that, that come to mind immediately. Um, you know, you said something fascinating that, that really hit me, you know, right in my heart. You know, you said there are six million stories that were not taped. And I, I'd like to just expand upon that because actually there are more like 12 million stories that were not taped. And if you really want to get technical, there were probably 52 million stories. And I think this is something that most people don't really realize. Because whenever we talk about World War II, whenever we talk about the Holocaust, the first number that comes to mind is 6 million. But as I was, you know, I've introduced you to the Dachau album project that I've been working on. And what I learned, being a child of Jewish Holocaust survivors, Six million, six million, six million. I was shocked when I found out that there were six million non-Jewish prisoners who were also murdered and that 52 million soldiers, men, women, and children died 
in World War II. So you, I assume, and I know the answer, are not Jewish. Am I correct? Correct. How did you get interested in this particular subject? What okay. brought you to this? So uh, I will definitely answer that, but thank you, Avi. And um, yes, I, I've always used, when I speak about Jews lost in the Holocaust, I always say at least 6 million, and that's a conservative number. And as you know, every with every passing year, they find out that there was a new satellite or sub camp. Uh, and, and historians were way off count in the total number of concentration camps, sub camps and satellite camps. Um, with every passing year, we find another Nazi that ran and hid somewhere and was just uncovered. Just this year, they found an old man who was a guard and I'll be darn, guess what? He was on the death march to the Nazi Titanic, the guy that uh, just sending to Israel for. Uh, so yeah, at least 6 million and 52 to perhaps 60 million dead around the world and at least another 6 million non-Jews. So um, I, I, the answer is a couple of things. Um, uh, one, you know, I could say as an, histor as an historian, um, how can anybody that does what I do for a living not be passionate about and not dedicate part of their career and lives to studying the world's most horrific instance of genocide. I mean, how can you be an historian? And it would be like talking to an American historian who says, I'm not interested in the Civil War. Uh, right. So one, how can you not be? Uh, two, I have always uh, prided myself in being a champion of social justice. Uh, I'm not a woman, but I'm an ardent feminist. Uh, I'm not gay, but I've always been a strong advocate for same-sex equality. Uh, I'm not an immigrant to this country within the last many, many, many generations, but I'm an advocate for that. So to me, it's a no brainer. Uh, to, uh, thirdly, my hero, as you know, is Harry Truman. And um, if, if anybody loves Harry the way I do, one of the great stories is that Truman risked his presidency in 1948 to bring in over 390,000 Jewish refugees and displaced persons. And Truman is the first leader in the world to recognize Israel. Truman is like a father figure to Abba Eben and like a brother to the great Dr. Chaim Weizmann. So in reading Harry, uh, I was inspired by it. But lastly, um, I just think the, the question should be for all people, for all non-Jews, let's say, how come they are not uh, passionate about that? How can you not make this part of your life's work? Uh, so to me, it's it's, it's, it just becomes something that I've done for all three decades of my career and intend to continue. Uh, and by the way, we did option the book uh, to a group of Hollywood folks. So if I have any role in it, I know who I'm getting to be one of the uh. actors. No question. I'm thinking Herbert Selpine, the brilliant, difficult, multifaceted director, or maybe the dashing captain of the ship who actually Bertrand, Heinrich Bertram, he tries to save the prisoners on his ship. Uh, oh. Yeah, he risks his life and, and actually he's sentenced to, um, you know, there were other tribunals besides Nuremberg. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, and he was, yeah, yeah. He was yeah. at the Hamburg tribunals and found guilty and he was headed off for a horrible fate. But some former, a handful of the, of the Jewish survivors of the ship go to Hamburg and say, no, he tried to save us. He tried to give us food and water, tried to prevent the Gestapo from getting on board, and tried to get us off the ship. So they saved his life at the trials. Right. Wow. Fascinating. So, so you said something also. You said, you know, we, of course, must never forget. Um, I believe that it's more than that. It's not only should we never forget, we must forever remember you know, we have to look at the positive way. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, you are a professor at Lynn University and you are teaching your students this material. And I know that there are Holocaust studies mandated now in, um, I know it was nine states and then I think it went up to 15. Yeah, um, about, yeah. yeah, so it's about 15 states that are mandating some form of Holocaust education. Florida being one of them, one of the first. Right. Yeah, one of the first. Um, although, from what I understand, the funding for that program Correct. has now diminished Correct. significantly. Correct. Um, but, but what that brings up is if there are 15 states that are mandated, well, that means there are 35 states that are not. Yeah. 
So how do we reach, you know, and especially nowadays when you have people who are, you know, anti-Semitism is on the rise all over the world. Racism is on the rise all over the world. Intolerance is on the rise all over the world. You have QAnon now that is coming into its own politically who are promoting the protocols of the elders of Zion. Zion. Yes. I mean, yes. I am I flabbergasted. I know. I know. So I know. the reason we wanted to bring this liberation commemoration into our Why I Love Yiddish Fest was the idea that we must forever remember and spread the word. Yeah. How, Robert, how do we reach the millions and millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions who are not aware not only not aware, but even believe that it's all a hoax you know, and fake news. Yeah, I, I, that's the million dollar question, Avi. And I think this program will go a long way toward it. And I think you and I had talked about uh, you maybe making this program part of a curriculum uh, guide that we distribute to schools and so on. Uh, yeah, th there's no question. Um, I did a book tour uh, a part of it with the National Jewish Book Council, who was wonderful. And then I did another book tour. My guess was maybe 30 cities in total for this uh, Nazi Titanic book. And I had someone that approached me during the tour uh, and said to me something that I never had somebody say to me before. A man came up at an event and screamed at me that the Holocaust never happened. And I like to think that I'm reasonably quick on my feet, but I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. So I remember going back to my hotel room that night and I, I sat and sat and sat and I thought, I got to think of something to say if this ever happens again. On that book tour, Avi, I had seven people yell at me that the Holocaust never happened. I guess they read that there's a book about Nazis and about a secret from the war. And it brought out all the QAnon types or the, you know, whomever these, whatever rock they've been living under. And I had seven. So what I would do when they would yell at me uh, the audience would be just shocked. I would tell the audience, let them speak. And I would tell the person, listen, I'm here to talk about a book and sell a book. You're interrupting. I will give you two minutes. Tell us why the Holocaust never happened. And of course, a couple seconds into it, they're dropping curse words, uh, Zog, the Zionist occupied government. They're citing the protocols of the elders of Zion, some conspiracy uh, Jews killed Jesus. I mean, just crazy stuff that has been going on. Uh, uh, blood libel, that Jews kill Christian boys and use their blood in matzah and Passover f bread. Uh, you know, same stuff, two th that's what QAnon believes, for 2,000 years. So I would let them scream for a couple seconds, then they would yell, F me, and then they would storm out of the speech. But the point was, everybody that was there, including me, became even more committed to telling these stories and fighting against this because they had seen that. I was giving a, um, I was on a, a, a river cruise uh, uh, on the Danube. Uh, six yes, years I, wanted, I wanted you to tell us about your river cruises because that's yeah. how Joan met you. Yes. And that's how Joan introduced us. So Joan was on one last year and, and my, my, my buddy, the quartermaster Abe, uh, 99 years young, was on one, uh, two with me last year. So we did a World War II D-Day. We did a Jewish heritage. But six years ago, I was on a different one. And we were in Budapest. And right there were that remarkable memorial of the shoes next to the edge of the Danube, which is just a draw drop, jaw droppingly powerful memorial. And across the, the, the way is that magnificent historic synagogue. So there's a group of us there and we have a local tour guide and we're gonna do a, a tour of Budapest. And the tour guide walks up to us and, and after he introduces himself, this is what he says, nothing happened here. We didn't do anything. And he got 30 seconds into it, what he didn't realize was it was a Jewish heritage tour. And, you know, everybody on our tour was well-read, well-traveled. I stopped him 30 seconds into it and go, wait a minute, time out. We just told him, you can go home, you're fired. But um, the point being, what if they were high school kids from Kansas? What if they were students from Chile or Bolivia? What if they were kids from Kenya? They would have no idea about the misinformation that they were being uh, fed. So you're right. We need to find ways of doing this. What, what's exciting, I think, right now, the horrible news is we're losing this generation of survivors. So we're going to, I have, um, for 30 years of my career, every year, if not every semester, 
I bring survivors to my classroom to talk to talk to the students. But what's happening now is, and I had a long talk with Deborah Oppenheimer, who I mentioned at the beginning, the Academy Award winning filmmaker. She's the one that did the movie uh, on the Kinder Transport uh, into the Arms of Stranger, which is a remarkable film. She was saying that what the what they're doing right now is they're interviewing survivors with this uh, voice recognition technology, like Siri, or like when you're, you know, your car talks to you or your phone. And right. what it is, is they ask survivors a battery of questions and then tape a short answer. So in another 20 or 30 years, uh, uh, you know, or not, hell, another five years, um, they'll have these interviews with a holographic 3D person right. um, and a student in another five years can say, how old were you when you were put into a camp? And the voice recognition will, will activate it. And the person will say, I was only nine when I was sent to Dachau or, or you know, Treblinka. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be a resource that can be, as this generation lives on social media and handheld digital platforms, this is a technology that can come to all these students. We've got to find ways of putting this in the schools and we all, everybody that's that's viewing this, by definition of them being here today, they're passionate about it. We have to lean on those other 35 or so states to mandate the curriculum. Our curriculum in Florida was very well done. Our mutual friend, Avi, Dr. Alan Berger, the eminent Holocaust scholar from Florida Atlantic University was part of the curriculum. So if Alan's a part of it, it was done well. But you're right, they've been gutting the budget. It's not prioritized. And the teachers are not being trained uh, on how to, it's one thing to have a curriculum, but you just can't plug it in. You have to have the teachers that are trained to know how to use the curriculum. And we're just simply not doing that. Well, I look forward to spending quite a bit of time over the next few years working with you to coming up with new and exciting and interesting ways to spread the word. I believe we have to do it through theater and film and television, yeah. and music, yeah. and concerts, telling the stories, more books. Um, you know, I think I agree. we have to find new ways. And the children of survivors, like me, have to pick up the mantle mm -hmm. and, and keep on going. Um, I would like to tell everyone who's watching right now to go buy this book. So, you know, so they can really learn the details. Uh, your lecture was amazing, but I'm sure the book really delves Thank you, Avi. And as soon as this COVID crisis, behind, crisis is behind us, you're going to be performing at Lynn as we, we arranged it last year and then the pandemic hit. So that would be a good test run on the types of programs that we can bring to college students uh, and then bring it down to K through 12. Yeah, I think right. you're right, Avi. Thank what you. we're learning now is we can do all these things virtually as well, which makes it available to such a wide audience. Right now, as we speak, we have people from all over the world watching what we're doing. So thank you for being with me. Um, and I really appreciate uh, your spending the time because you are an extraordinary man. And I thank you so very much. Thank you for what you're doing with this and, and good luck with the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you. So before I leave everyone, uh, Robert, thank you for coming. I just want everybody to know uh, that you should go by the Nazi Titanic. Um, we have several programs coming up. Um, at 6 p.m., we have a world premiere documentary film screening called Two Heads Are Better Than One, The Making of the Ben Ferenc Bus. Ben Ferenc, of course, was the American prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials. And the great Jewish artist, Yaakov Heller, created a magnificent bust of Ben Ferenc they spent time together and a documentary film was made all about it. And we are premiering the world premiere of this and an interview with Yaakov that I did with Yaakov and Eric Klein, the director and producer of the film. That begins at six o'clock on all of our platforms, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and our website, yiddishfest.org. At 7.30, we will continue to see Yaakov Heller's magnificent Jewish artwork, Why I Love Jewish Art with Yaakov Heller. At 8 p.m., we have our first Klezmer in Quarantine concert, which is Yiddish tangos, 
with the great maestro Aaron Kula on the accordion. Um, and this was actually the first program that we did virtually and has been seen by over 115,000 people all over the world. And finally tonight, um, also part of our liberation commemoration events, uh, as the Two Heads Are Better Than One documentary, is the Jeffrey Mustard Project which I think is absolutely fascinating. It's called Boycott 1902. And we're talking about human rights. We're talking about civil rights. We're talking about equal rights um, and, and, and how to make the world a better place. Tikkun olam. In 1902, the, the meat barons in America took the price of kosher meat up from 12 cents a pound to 18 cents a pound overnight, 50%. And the women in New York City, the religious Jewish women went crazy and they protested for three weeks. They burned shops, they got arrested. They, they protested in a way that ended up changing the laws in the United States of America. And Jeffrey Mustard, has created a hip hop musical and a television series, um, or at least a proposal for it. Um, and he is amazing. And at 10 p.m. tonight, we will be premiering that project on our Why I Love Yiddish Fest. I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors, the Betsy Hotel, the University of Miami, and Restream. Um, and I want you to please take our survey go online, go to all of our uh, outlets and take our survey because we are also sponsored by Miami-Dade County. And we want them to know how much you appreciated what we do. We want them to know what you liked, what you didn't like, how we can make it better. And we're very grateful to have all of you with us today. These programs will stay on our website and on our Facebook um, and on our YouTube, or at least on our YouTube and our Facebook for at least a few more days, maybe longer. Um, and all of our programming on this festival, all 44 events over seven days from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. are free, but it's not free to us. We have to uh, pay all the wonderful people who are working on our festival. And so if you could help us, that would be great. Go to our whyilovejewish.org slash donate and go to our website and support what we are doing. So thank you so very much. And please uh, stay attentive uh, for just another moment because I would like to um, make you aware. Ah, what happened? I think I lost everybody here. Um, I'd like to make you aware of what we are doing. So thank you again for joining us and hopefully we'll see you again at 6 p.m.
I'm a professor at the University of Miami, and I am the director of the George Feldenkrais program in Judaic studies. And I'm the founding director of the Sue and Leonard Miller Center for Contemporary Judaic Studies, which is a university-wide center at the University of Miami. If we look today at the Jewish world, the Jewish communities in most countries still have segments which adhere to the old definition of who is a Jew, but much larger segments today consider themselves Jewish because they are part of a tradition, part of a culture. One such important element has become known more recently as Jewish peoplehood, a subject which is of great interest to me personally and to the programs which I am uh, developing. Jewish peoplehood includes, for instance, a, a very important component of the Yiddishkeit initiative. And that's why when I heard of this idea, right away, I uh, outstretched my hand and we are developing the power.